All right, it's um, our pleasure uh, today to have Emily Pervoin from PNNL, who will be uh, telling us about uh, applied topology for discrete structures. Take it away, Emily. So uh, I'm really pleased to be here to talk to you today about um, applied topology for discrete structures. This is the work that I've been doing with a large team for a while now um, and really excited to share with you all. Uh, so I credited Cliff Jocelyn and Auden Myers on these slides who they may or may not be on. I can't see everybody. Um, but uh, really, it's a huge team. Um, Cliff and Auden helped me with a few of the specific slides, so I credited them on the front, but I want to acknowledge everybody. Uh, if you're not on here and you work with me, I'm sorry, I probably just um, missed people in my fray of looking for all the folks that I work with on this um, large pile of work. Um, uh, but it's a it's a great group, and um, I wouldn't be able to, to talk to you today without all of these folks. Um, also, just a, a little brief, I don't know, commercial, I suppose, uh, about the capability that we're developing that this work fits under uh, at uh, Pacific Northwest National Lab, where I work. Uh, this is, we call it topology and networks. Um, we have mathematics of hypernetwork signs, hypergraphs, and also uh, computational topology and data analysis of multidimensional data to include discrete uh, things like um, hypergraph walks and connectivity. I'll talk about some of those, as well as the uh, computational topology of, of homology and topological data analysis. We have a software tool that we use frequently, and we're it's, uh, in development all the time, HyperNetX. Uh, I encourage you to use that if you enjoy any of these graphics that are on this uh, these slides, um, or if you are interested in the hypergraph work, um, particularly at the discrete level, but we're working on getting um, the hom homological stuff in there as well. Um, and we have a number of different kinds of applications. I'm only going to be able to touch on a little bit of that in this talk, uh, but if you're interested in any of these applications and learning more about what we do in this area, uh, please reach out. I'm happy to talk, um, give you some more information. So let me dive into the to the meat of the talk. So I'm going to put it into basically three sections, starting out with hypernetwork science. This is the discrete side of the talk. Uh, I'm going to spend a bit of time here because I'm going to assume that most of the folks in this um, talk know more about the topology than about the discrete hypernetwork science. So I'll give some definitions there. And then I'll talk about the topological interpretations of um, actually just hypergraphs in this talk. Um, and, and then close with some dynamics of topology. Um, when, when those hypergraphs are changing, how do we measure those changes uh, in a discrete way and in a topological way? And I'll have some motivating examples uh, throughout. So our work um, focuses, uh, because we're an applied science lab, we have applications. So we, we deal with relational data very frequently. This is when you have data in which objects and um, are related um, in a pairwise or multi-way way. So objects and the relationships between or among those objects. Uh, some, one example is a publication database. Think Math MathSciNet, PubMed, your favorite publication database. database. You have objects that are authors, and then you have relationships that are collaborations. So if two people collaborated on a paper, there's uh, a relationship between those two. If four people collaborated on a paper, there's a bunch of relationships between all those. And you can study how authors cluster based on their discipline, maybe. Um, maybe there's bridge authors that work between areas of math. Um, those are the kinds of things you might want to know. Um, another example is protein interactions, where objects are proteins and the relationships are things like measured or predicted, um, uh, co-expression or um, interactions between those uh, proteins. We want to study how, again, they cluster maybe based on function um, or they're, um, you can find uh, uh, proteins that are more or less important in various systems. On the right here, we've got a couple of pictures of the, the string database. This is a protein interaction database um, and some network science co-authors up here. So relational data is really important, but sometimes pairwise relationships, as those were depicted on this slide here, all of these um, edges, 
we all know we're talking about graphs, right? Vertices and edges uh, are pairwise. Sometimes those pairwise relationships aren't enough to capture everything um, of the complexity of the data. So uh, I we encourage people to think, what is your data natively? Do you get groups or do you get pairs? If you get pairs, great. But if you get groups and you um, squash it down to all of the sub pairs, then you're losing some information. So for example, in a co-authorship um, network, you could really think about it as multi-way collaborations. Papers are sometimes written by two people, but sometimes they're written by five people or nine people or 27 people. And you wanna capture that multi-way interaction. Similarly, friendship and following relationships. You know, on Facebook, you have friendships, right? I'm friends with you, you're friends with me, those are pairwise. You have following in on Twitter and, and other uh, social networks. Um, but you also have group membership and those groups are, you know, lots of people can talk and it's not just two people uh, talking with each other, it's the whole group is seeing it. Um, and so those are groups that are important to be modeled. And finally, here on this slide with protein interactions, proteins don't always interact just pairwise. Sometimes you need three proteins or four or seven in order to have some relationship or some reaction happen. And if one of them is missing, nothing happens. And so you need to have that complexity of the, the high order relationships. And so if you need that, if, you, if it's important to track the multi-way relationships, then hypergraphs are the tool for you. So they provide this mathematical model of data when multi-way relationships are the thing. And you can ask questions like connectivity and clustering, just like you can in graphs, um, and, and model these, these multi-way relationships. So, um, and I'm, I'm kind of purposely not, I'm not introducing graphs here. I'm gonna hope that everybody knows something about graphs, but if you don't, if you're not familiar with graphs, um, don't worry about it. We're just talking about hypergraphs in this talk, and uh, you can think of a graph as a hypergraph where every edge is size two. So everything that I'm talking about uh, for hypergraphs works for graphs, um, and so don't don't worry if you're not familiar with graphs or networks. So oh, my phone is buzzing. Um, so uh, we have vertice vertices, the dots, and we have hyperedges, the big blobs. Um, and those that's what makes up a hypergraph. The edges are um, all or are any subset of the vertices. So to just get a little bit more formal with this, um, a hypergraph uh, again has has vertices, a set V, and a family of edges. And I'm specifically not calling it a set of edges because sometimes we want repeated edges. We want multiple edges to have the same membership, the same set of vertices. So every edge is a subset of vertices. You could think of it as a multi-set as well. Typically, we think of it as that E sub I are the names of the edges. Um, and then you map those names of the edges to the set of vertices. And for shorthand, we just say that the edge is contained within the vertex set. And this is what I said on the prior slide, a graph is a hypergraph where all of the edges have size two. <clears throat> all right. Um, so we have some special cases that we like to treat. Um, maybe we have an empty edge. Perhaps you had a group of people that were pretty active, but everybody left <laughs> or um, nobody showed up or whatever. That's That would be an empty edge and that's allowed in a, a hypergraph. But multi -edges, edges I already mentioned, isolated vertices. Um, these are vertices that are not in any hyper edge. These are common in graphs as well. Um, and redundant vertices, these are two vertices, which are in exactly the same set of hyper edges. This, this does not happen in a graph um, unless you have a multigraph. So these are special cases that you have to treat when you're thinking about hypergraphs. Um, there's many different ways to represent um, pictorially or, or in uh, data structures. Uh, visually, uh, Euler diagram is what we're gonna focus on in this talk. Sometimes we'll see these simplicial diagrams, but in a very special case later. Um, so we just put the dots down on the page and we draw uh, rubber bands around all of the vertices that are contained within an edge. So here we've got a singleton edge and a three-way edge and then three pairwise edges. A bipartite diagram is another way of, of looking at hypergraphs by putting all of the vertices of the hypergraph on the left and all of the names of the hyperedges on the right, and then connecting a vertex to a hyperedge if there's a containment. Um, and this is, I'll say something more about this on the next slide. 
Uh, incidence matrix is another uh, important structure, often for computation. Uh, we have our rows as vertices and our columns as hyper edges, and we put a one or a zero depending on the membership. Um, and then sometimes we'll write as set notation. So that's the basic definition of what a hypergraph is. Any, let me pause for any kind of brief questions about the definition. Nothing? All righty. So one, another thing that's uh, special about hypergraphs is this notion of duality. So on the prior slide, I mentioned that uh, we have this incidence matrix where the rows are vertices and the columns are hyper edges. I could have switched that matrix. I could have transposed that matrix and gotten an entirely different hypergraph, but the same sort of underlying structure and the exact same underlying bipartite graph representation. And so we want to think of hypergraphs not as just a hypergraph, but as a dual pair, because these are uh, mutually um, defining, right? Once you have the hypergraph, the dual to it is unique and, and vice versa. So um, think about hypergraphs as dual pairs. It's a choice of which rows or columns you make to be the vertices or the edges. Um, there are also graph approximations of hypergraphs that people use very frequently. Uh, most common would be this, um, we call the clique expansion or the underlying graph. It takes every vertex of the hypergraph, puts it down in your graph, and puts a clique for every uh, hyper edge. So this is a three-way hyper edge. You get this clique here. Uh, this is a two-way hyper edge. You get this two clique and this two clique. But notice that you've lost that three-way interaction. You, these two triangles are now indistinguishable. If you forget um, where it came from, you can't tell where there might have been a three-way relationship. Similarly, you can do the clique expansion of the dual. Turns out this is also known as the line graph of the hypergraph where for the original hypergraph, you put down a vertex in your line graph for every edge that's in your hypergraph. So the, they're color-coded, it should be color-coded correctly. So edge one here, the yellow one is this vertex here and so forth. Uh, and then you put an edge between these uh, hyper edge vertices um, if there's an intersection between the two hyper edges. So you get this underlying thing. But notice that this is exactly the clique expansion of the dual, and that'll come back um, a, a, a bit later in the talk. Emily, yes. there was a question um, uh, sure. by Syed. Um, uh -huh. Syed is asking, what is the importance of empty hyper edges and what does empty hyper edge corresponds to? Um, the, the importance of an empty hyper edge is more for understanding your data. Um, and um, I think about it kind of in the case of, of dynamic data, which we'll get to at the very end of the talk. Um, let's say you've got a Facebook group or a, a Reddit, subreddit. Um, it's pretty active, right? Maybe uh, there's a lot of people that are talking, but then um, some period of time passes and nobody's posting in that subreddit. That, would, that subreddit still exists, but nobody's talking in it. And so it would consider, you could consider it as an empty hyper edge. You could also just consider it as gone, but um, but it's not gone. It's it's available for somebody to use later. Um, does that help? Nope. Hearing no objection, I'll say that, that yeah. that's good. <laughs> yeah, All right. He, um, so, so, one thing that I want to say about these graph approximations is that um, you might think, oh, well, great. If I have this hypergraph, I can just do graph theory stuff on its clique expansion and its line graph. Those, those must be determining, just like the dual is, is determining the hypergraph and vice versa. You must be able to determine the hypergraph from its clique expansion and line graph. This is not true, unfortunately. There are examples, and not all that big, um, where you have two completely different hypergraphs that have the exact same clique expansion and line graph. So um, you really need the full hypergraph to uh, to study those multi-way in interactions. You can't go, you can't find um, a graph approximation besides kind of a bipartite graph that will um, completely determine the hypergraph. So because of that, we need to generalize network science concepts to hypergraphs. 
And so we do that in a fairly straightforward way. Degree is the number of edges at a vertex. Edge sizes, well, in a, in a graph, it's always two, but in a hypergraph, we can think of what are all the edge sizes in my hypergraph. Um, paths, walks, diameters, connected components, centrality, all these things can be um, uh, thought about and, and generalized from graphs to hypergraphs. I'm going to dive into these, um, these three here for uh, a moment here um, to, to give you an example of where it's not quite so straightforward, um, but it generalizes pretty nicely. And this is all um, in a paper, Hypernetwork Science via High Order Hypergraph Walks um, that was led by Sanan Aksoy. It's a very lovely paper, in, I think. Um, and if you're interested in this kind of hypernetwork science stuff, I really encourage you to check out that paper. So in a graph, if you have a walk, you go from a vertex to an edge to a vertex to an edge and so forth, back and forth. Um, you can think about that as a sequence of just vertices. Uh, because unless you've got a multigraph, every pair of vertices have a, has a unique edge that they are in, right? Um, similarly, you could think of it as a sequence of edges because every pair of edges has a unique vertex that they intersect in. So they're mutually um, determining. For a set of vertices gives you a set of unique edges and vice versa. In a hypergraph, this is not the case. I can have two vertices, these two vertices here, that belong to two completely different hyperedges. This is not a multi-hypergraph. Um, and E1 and E4 are totally different hyperedges. Similarly, I can have two hyperedges that um, intersect in many vertices. So if I have just a sequence of edges, it does not determine a unique sequence of vertices. And if I have a sequence of vertices, it does not determine a unique sequence of edges. So you need to have two notions of walks, one between edges and one between vertices. Um, and then in the next few slides, I'm going to focus on the edge walks because um, they, for me, they're more intuitive. Uh, but the vertices, vertex walks, you can define actually in the dual sense. So we come up with this notion of an S walk. This is a sequence of edges such that uh, every pair next to each other has to intersect in at least S vertices. So a one walk is a typical graph walk. Every pair of edges intersects in, a, in at least one, exactly one, uh, vertex. But the nice thing here is that you can kind of get a strength of your walk but, or a width of your walk by increasing s. So here's a graph walk where every uh, pair of edges intersects it in size one. Here's a hypergraph walk with the same property, um, interactions, weak interactions, you would say, of width one. But over here, I might think that b and i and j are a little bit more related than on the left hypergraph because there's so much intersection between the different hypergraphs. So there's more potential for inter intersection between B and I and J. <clears throat> so once you have a definition of a walk, you can define a path, uh, distance, and components from it. That's how you do this. You build it up in a graph. If you go from a walk to a path and so forth. So we can do that with S walks as well. An S path is an S walk where edges are not repeated. So here's an S walk from five to three to one back to five to ten to twelve i can get rid of that self that, that loop here and just turn it into a path five to ten to twelve this is a one walk or a one path rather now if i add in these two edges the the maroonish one and the blue dark blue one now i have a two path from five to twelve because all of my intersections are size two now uh, the S distance then is the length of the shortest S path between two edges. The diameter is the longest S distance in the hypergraph. And the components are collections of edges so that any pair are connected via an S path. So here's a three component. Uh, these two edges, brown and pink, intersect in size four. So that's a three component. This is a two component. There's any pair of edges you can choose within this dotted line. There is a two path between them. And finally, you can define centrality. So once you have a notion of walks and paths, uh, you can and diameter and shortest path, you can define between the centrality. So in a graph uh, up here, so the, the question is, which nodes um, are on many shortest paths? In, in the graph, it's a node-based question. Um, and so given a vertex, you sum up over all pairs of vertices that are not itself and ask how many shortest paths are there between S and T? on the denominator, and then in the numerator, how many of those shortest paths go through V? So if this is a close to one, then that means that V is very central. And if it's close to one for 
all of the pairs, S and T, it means it's very, very central. Um, and so the higher between the centrality means it's on a lot of these walks. So the red nodes in this graph are the most uh, central, and then the ones on the periphery here um, are, are lighter colored. They have lower between the centrality. You can do the exact same thing in a hypergraph um, for a hyperedge E. You look at all of the hyperedges G and F that are not E, that are at least size S, and, and, and ask the same question about shortest paths. So we did this in um, an example in biological data. We had um, uh, cells infected with viral strains of these five viruses, and we um, we didn't actually collect this data, I should say this. We were handed this data. Samples were analyzed at various time points post-infection and looked at which genes are expressed uh, more or less um, than a, a controlled sample. So we created a hypergraph where the nodes are uh, conditions. A condition means a virus, a strain of that virus, a cell type, a time point, and then you sample and you get all of the gene expressions for that particular condition or that particular cell state. Um, those are the nodes of our hypergraph and the edges are genes, those things that we're measuring the expression of. And we say, you can read the, the description down here, but I'll say it uh, a little bit differently that a condition vertex is contained in a gene hyperedge if that can if that gene is significantly perturbed from the base from the the control in that condition so if an, a vertex is not in a gene it means that that gene is really kind of not moving not doing anything between a control and the current condition but if it is in a gene hyperedge that gene is doing something significant uh, in that particular condition and we want to study the structure of this hypergraph. In particular, we wanted to find the genes that are central in viral infection. And so we, we hypothesized that if we uh, compute hypernetwork science measures, in particular between the centrality and closeness centrality, which I didn't describe define, then, um, and I look at the ranking, so what are the most central down to the least central, um, the, the immune response will be higher, more concentrated towards the top of that list, than if you uh, build a graph representation. Um, and we measure this using this uh, thing called enrichment score. So if I have my ranking, so this is high between the centrality, low between the centrality, and a target set of known um, uh, immune response genes. Uh, if the things are all kind of distributed more towards the top, we have a high enrichment score. If they're more towards the bottom, which is what we don't want, we have a low enrichment score, even negative. And if they're kind of uniformly distributed through my range list, we get around zero. And so we, we did this, we built this hypergraph and we measured the, the rankings from hypergraph betweenness, closeness, hyperedge size, a really simple measurement, some graph measures, and then a measure that's not graphy or hypergraphy. Uh, and what we found is the enrichment score measured here on the y-axis is much higher um, in all of our hypergraph measures than in any of our graph measures. And so in fact, yes, the hypergraph does give us a better uh, ranking. Things that are more known to be more central uh, are in fact more central in, in the graph um, or in the hypergraph than they are in the graph. So that was a, a nice win for our um, hypernetwork science uh, theory into, into some real practice. So at this point, I'm going to pivot. I Hopefully, I've convinced you that hypergraphs are um, both useful and interesting mathematically. Um, but of course, this is an applied topology seminar. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about topology for hey, Emily, Yes. There's a question on, on sure. the chat uh, sure, by thanks. Alex uh, Kunin. He, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll read it. And um, I think it might be related to a couple slides um, back. Is there a okay. way to describe this as applying a threshold to entries in a matrix? Um, might have been on slide 16 that's my guess but Alex. yeah I was I was just asking about the the genes the state versus gene I was oh. I was hoping that there was a way that I could wrap my head around it as I have a giant matrix and yes. I apply a threshold yes yep so this is the the like the matrix you can think about um so we have our now I've flipped it so my vertices are on the columns and my edges are on the rows these are the actual values of, of my sample versus control, um, log two of the sample versus control. So positive means it's upregulated, negative means downregulated. 
Uh, and what we did here is we we at, applied a threshold. Um, we took the absolute value, we applied a threshold, and we said, okay, if it's above z score above two, then we put a one. If it's below two, we put a zero. And now we've got an incidence matrix for a hypergraph. Yep. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So um, jumping into topology, and, and in this case, um, I'm not going to define things like simplicial complex, I'm gonna, uh, but if somebody does not know a simplicial complex, do please jump in, um, uh, and, and, and I'll go through a quick definition. Um, <clears throat> uh, but I'm hoping that in an applied topology seminar, we have a um, majority of folks that, that uh, have that background. Um, so or if you don't, you'll kind of get it from the description. So how do we interpret a hypergraph as a topological object? We've talked about already um, so far how we interpret a hypergraph as a discrete object, but a topological object is a bit different. Um, so one thing we can do is build a simplicial complex from our hypergraph. So here's a hypergraph. It's got a three -way ed two three-way edges and a four-way edge. Uh, we can add in all of the sub edges to my hypergraph. So all of the singleton vertices are hyper edges, all of the pairs are hyper edges, all of the three ways that aren't already there are hyper edges. And this kind of hardens my hypergraph into a simplicial complex, this tetrahedra with a triangle attached to it, a solid tetrahedra with a triangle attached to it in this particular case. But what we're doing here, we're adding information, right? Um, I said at the very beginning of this talk, we might have a case where a three-way edge really does not imply the pairwise edges, particularly like in a protein interaction network. The pairwise things might not be real interactions. So we're adding information. This somehow is not satisfying to me, at least. So we can do something that's a bit more complex. We can build other simplicial complexes uh, or chain complexes without adding or removing information. At least that's what the hope is, okay? So um, I'm gonna talk only about the restricted barycentric subdivision. That's all I think I'll have time uh, for in the in this talk. But there are other ways of building simplicial complexes from hypergraphs that aren't just adding in all of the sub edges that might capture uh, additional structure. And that question then is what hypergraph properties do each of these different interpretations capture? What do we want them to capture? What do they capture? Um, and the, the specific thing that we're going to be used to, to study the topological structure is homology. So I will say a little bit about homology. Um, given one of these um, topological objects, simplicial complexes, um, <clears throat> we want to look at what are the different voids or holes in different dimensions. In dimension zero, a hole is a connected component. Um, this is the Noted, noted as Betty zero is the number of connected components. Uh, Betty one is um, one dimensional holes. These are cycles or loops. Um, two dimensional are like soccer balls, hollow um, or a hollow torus or um, anything that's hollow, uh, but, but bounded by a two dimensional surface. And then three dimensional is the higher generalizations of those kinds of holes. So here's some examples of three hypergraphs where if you take the simplicial complex of this hypergraph, you end up with some simplicial complex and all of them have one component. Um, all of them have at least one one dimensional loop. You can really only see it here in DNS one. I have no idea where the loops are in two and three. Um, and in, in two and three, there's um, at least one void, um, which in three, I've got no clue where it is. In two, at least we've pulled out, this is uh, where one of these voids are. We've got three solid tetrahedra with like a kind of window pane stuck on the end um, to give a, a hollow tetrahedra here between these four. And so this is data from a cyber network where um, IP addresses resolve to different um, domain names. Um, and so this is uh, the DNS hypergraph. So this is the, the tool we're going to use to study the simplicial complexes that we build is, is homology. <clears throat> so um, let me step back for a moment and ask this question. Uh, what was it about a hypergraph that we want to capture using homology? Rather than just willy-nilly building any kind of simplicial complex that we want, let's ask this question of ourselves. One potential answer is that we want to study the structure of interactions among the hyperedges. If that's the answer, uh, that you have to this question, then the nerve complex might be what you're looking for. So what's the nerve? For every hyperedge, every blue hyperedge, we put a vertex. 
And every um, multi-way intersection among the hyper edges, we put a simplex. Um, so in this case, our nerve is just two, uh, one dimensional. There's only pairwise intersections, uh, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, but what's interesting, and I said this earlier, is that if I take the um, nerve of my hypergraph, it's exactly the same as the simplicial complex closure of my dual hypergraph. So here's a hypergraph, it's dual. The nerve and the closure are equal. They're not isomorphic, they're not, they're not homotopy equivalent. Well, they are, but they're not just isomorphic. They're not just homotopy equivalent. They are equal. Um, and so if, if the, homo oh, and then the Dauker theorem tells us that the closure of a hypergraph and the closure of its dual um, are homotopy equivalent. So if what you're looking for in homology of a hypergraph is the structure of interactions among the hyperedges, that is the homology of its nerve, you can actually get that information, at least the Betty numbers, by looking at the homology of its closure and just stopping there. So when I said we're adding information to this hypergraph by adding in all the sub edges, that is true. But if you're just looking for the shape of the interactions, you could you could do that with the shape of its uh, underlying, um, well, not underlying graph, but um, underlying simplicial complex. Okay, so I just want to point that out. But if this is not the answer to your question, the structure of interactions, then let's proceed. <clears throat> um, and I optimistically told Henry that I only had 35 minutes of content, and here I am at 33 minutes, and we're not done. But I will not take the full hour. I promise you that. Um, so restricted barycentric subdivision is a um, concept that that was developed by um, a group of, of us, um, a subgroup of the folks that were mentioned on that first slide, um, to give another interpretation of, um, and I'm not naming them all because there's seven or eight of us and uh, I'll probably miss somebody. Um, and I think I have the name somewhere on a different slide. So um, the restricted barycentric subdivision is a different way of creating a simplicial complex from a hypergraph. So the barycentric subdivision of a simplicial complex takes each face and replaces it with a vertex. So the AC edge is a face. I replace that with a vertex. The ABC face is a face uh, triangle. Uh, and I put a vertex there. And then I connect um, all of the subfaces. So AC is connected to ABC, A is connected to AC, so forth. And then I take the clique complex of this one skeleton. So because A is connect is contained in AC, which is contained in ABC, I put a triangle here. So that's the barycentric subdivision of a simplicial complex. But what about how we do how do we do this for a hypergraph when we don't have it's not a simplicial complex, right? We could build the simplicial complex, but we already said we, we don't want to do that. We we figured out what that means and we want to do something else. So what we do is we build the edge containment post set. So edge C is contained in BC, which is contained in ABC. It's also contained in CD. And then I can take the clique complex of this um, post set. So note that this is just the Hasse diagram. C is actually also connected to ABC because there's a containment order there. So when I take the clique complex, I get a triangle here for the left chain and a single edge for the right chain. Now, notice that um, if I took away the labels of this hyper or of this um, simplicial complex, it would be exactly the same as the um, closure of the this hypergraph, the simplicial complex closure, right? So maybe you're thinking, well, what did we do? But if you remove edge C, then that becomes not the case. The simplicial complex closure remains the same, a triangle with a tail. But if I remove edge C, the restricted barycentric subdivision becomes just two edges, BC connected to ABC and CD all on its own. Um, I also wanted to point out that this is the Via Torres Rips seminar and clique complexes are Via Torres Rips complexes. So I qualify for this seminar, um, yay. So what structure do we capture with this notion of a simplicial complex coming from a hypergraph? Um, one thing is uh, to note that intersections are not preserved unless we have them present as hyperedges. So um, noting that again, if, if C were not a hyperedge in its own, we'd have two different components, even though the hypergraph in the notion of a walk sense is in fact connected 
Uh, and so that's one thing that you're capturing is kind of the, the ability for uh, you to transit through intersections by virtue of another hyper edge. Um, so the, the easy, it's fairly easy to, to show that the number of um, connected components in your restricted very centric subdivision is bounded above by the number of toplexes, which are hyper edges that are not contained in any other hyper edge. So the uh, ABC hyper edge here is a toplex, the, the CD is a toplex, but BC and C are not toplexes. So this, um, the number of components is bounded above by the number of toplexes. Um, and it's sharp if there are no hyper edges contained within a toplex intersection. So that's one structure thing. Um, another thing is looking at the, the one dimensional and two dimensional voids and how we can get those. Um, so you can get, these are all one dimensional cycles that are, would be present in a hyper edge. If you look at the labels of the vertices here, those are the names of the hyper, or the sets of the hyper edges. Um, but these are restricted barycentric subdivisions. And so what we notice is to get one of these one dimensional cycles, we have to go um, containment and then contains, containment and then contains. So one is contained in one, two, four, which contains two, which is contained in one, two, three, which contains one and round and round we go. So that is how you get one dimensional cycles. You need this reverse back and forth containment, which means you can only have even length cycles, which is kind of interesting. If you have a uh, even length open cycles, if you have a triangle, it must be filled in. You can also get higher order, higher dimensional homology um, by um, this. This is here's an example of a hypergraph um, that has a two dimensional void in its restricted barycentric subdivision. Remember, these triangles have to be filled in because of what I said on the prior slide. This is the poset diagram, and we see. Um, we can see how we get from the hypergraph to the edge containment poset to the octahedron. Um, and notice that what we're basically doing is taking a cone up and a cone and putting it on our prior cycle. This is a suspension um, in the topological sense where we take something with homology and dimension K and add a, and cone off that dimension K homology and end up with something in the homology in dimension K plus one. Uh, and you can do this in the simplicial complex land, but it turns out that those, when you do that suspension, um, you you can pull it back to the hypergraph and and find out that there is in fact a hypergraph that has that suspension as its restricted barycentric subdivision. So here's the example of, again on the prior slide of taking a cycle and coning it off to get a octahedron and a two dimensional void. <clears throat> Uh, in the in the hypergraph sense, where what we're doing is we're taking what we had. So here's our one dimensional cycle going from uh, hyper edge two to one two three to one to one two four back to two. That's our one dimensional cycle in the restricted barycentric subdivision. In order to make the octahedron, we added two hyper edges and two vertices. So we added vertex five and vertex six, and then we added hyper edge that contains five and everything else that was already there, and then one that contains six and everything else that was already there. This serves as the two top bounds um, back here of my post set, which cones off everything below it. So we're adding this purple vertex and all of and simplices with all of the prior simplices and the F vertex plus triangles with all of the previously existing simplices. We can just do that again. So every time we want to increase the homology of our restricted barycentric subdivision, all we have to do is add two new vertices and two hyper edges, one that contains um, the one new vertex and everything else, one that contains the other and everything else. And this will cone off our, our homology. Notice that if I were to create the simplicial complex, um, it would be not terribly interesting here. It would be, um, you know, two two large simplices completely filled in with uh, that, that intersect um, very highly. And that's all it would be. We have no higher order homology, but in this way we can create arbitrarily higher order homology um, in, in a hypergraph, um, which gives us uh, kind of a new tool to explore the, the intersection structure of these hypergraphs. So um, I am gonna move on to the last part of my talk, which uh, is not super long. Um, uh, about dynamics. Uh, so just kind of 
roadmap where we are. We've talked about the discrete part of hypergraphs. We've talked about homology of a single hypergraph from a spatial complex um, and this restricted barycentric subdivision. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about evolution. So let's say I've got a uh, what we call a temporal hypergraph. We can think of uh, uh, all of these. Uh, these are vertices that are uh, entities and hyperedges that are events, entities and events. So an entity is part of an event, um, then they have a hyperedge. But what if there's a time stamp on each of my hyperedges that events happen before or after each other? We can think of then a trajectory of sub hypergraphs. So if I look at only the time span between four and five, I have these one, two, three, four, five, six hyperedges. If I go then forwards in time, I've lost one or a couple of my hyperedges and I've gained a hyperedge. And so I have this temporal evolution of my system. What we want to do is measure the change in structure, uh, this change in homology, the change in other kinds of distributions in our system. We can do that in a discrete way by looking at um, edit cost. Uh, this is something, again, borrowed from graph theory. If I've got two graphs, I want to quantify how much work I need to do to turn one into the other. If I am given an, a vertex map, like saying edge or vertex A maps to this, vertex B maps to this, and vertex C maps to this, I get an edge map for free. The green has to map to the green, blue, pink, so forth. Um, uh, so that's, uh, you can think of the edit cost of this mapping from uh, A, B, C to F of A, F of B, and F of C uh, is, uh, is a cost of two because I have to remove one edge and I have to add another edge. Um, but I could find a better mapping of vertices that would give me an edit distance of zero. If I instead mapped um, A up, up to this guy uh, and B and C over here, I could get an edit cost of zero. Um, you can do the same kind of thing in a hypergraph, but it's a lot more nuanced because um, you need to specify not just vertex maps, but edge maps. So if I map um, the vertices from this left hypergraph to the right by name, so A goes to A and so forth, you could make an argument for either of the uh, sets of colored arrows for edge maps. So this BCD edge could map to the BC edge, or it could map to the ACD edge. You could make an argument either way. Um, and, and so you have to have vertex and edge maps. Um, and then edges have size, not just existence. So if you remove a vertex from an edge, is it still the same vertex? If you just leave, if one person leaves a subreddit, the subreddit is still there, right? So, so you can remove things and, and add things um, depending on the rules that you provide. So we developed three different kinds of edit cost frameworks, one where um, you can remove a wholesale, a vertex or an edge, and it's just one edit cost, one, one operation. Um, that's sorry, that's the collective edits. Individual edit says, um, <clears throat> if I want to leave a system, I have to say goodbye to every group individually, and then I got to leave. So that's all of these different edits. Um, and then there's cases where you would want edges to be immutable. Um, if I change membership, if I lose a, if my edge loses somebody, now I'm a completely different system. So all of these are valid in different kinds of applications. What else is valid is topological measurement. Um, so this is in the case, um, we're going to talk about zigzag persistent homology. Persistent homology has a case uh, of uh, a sequence of um, spaces where one is successively contained in the next. And I track when a, a cycle or any of these topological um, objects, cycles, voids, components um, appears and disappears in my sequence of um, uh, containment. Uh, there's a general uh, generalization of this, which is zigzag persistence that has arrows going either direction. Um, and But you can make an arbitrary case where you have just a sequence of spaces. These are going to be temporal sequence of spaces. And you can put in unions and interse or intersections to get <clears throat> one of these general cases where the arrows go in, in, in both directions. Um, you can still look at when cycles or other topological features are born and die, but now it's not a uh, well, it's still like what space, you know, did I, was it space one, space two, space three, or one of these half spaces um, at, at which these things are born and die. Um, so as an example, here's a temporal sequence at the bottom of some special complexes, and we want to know if features persist over time. So here's a, you know, two components, there's a loop, what, what kinds of things uh, persist. We put timestamps on either of them, on all of them, 
add a, an empty set at the end so that everything dies. Uh, and then we compute this persistence uh, zigzag persistence diagram that tells us that this single loop here is born at time two, it's still there at 2.5, and it's it dies at three. So we have a one-dimensional uh, tracking of that loop. And then the, the single connected components as well um, can, can be tracked. So starts off with two and then turns into one, and at the end we get two again. So a final example is, um, I, I've been alluding to Reddit data kind of all along is one of the hypergraph examples, but here's some actual data of uh, a COVID subreddit from early in the pandemic, the end of uh, January to the end of uh, March. Uh, and we have almost 4,000 threads um, and uh, almost 2,000 authors. So we're gonna have a node as the author and the edges are threads. So if an author posts in a thread, then um, there's then it's in that hyper edge. Um, and there's a bunch of different um, subreddits. So we just look, this is just looking at one of them. If so you look at all of them and getting an even bigger system. Um, <clears throat> and over time here, we're tracking the sizes, the number of vertices in the hypergraph for a two hour window shifted forward by one every one hour and the number of edges. This is work by Auden Myers, by the way. Um, uh, and then we can look at, you know, where these subreddits come in um, at what time. So what does the zigzag homology tell us? Um, here we have uh, tracking the one dimensional loops and the um, connected components over time. So there's some interesting long living connected components that aren't just the, <clears throat> the obvious, the, the one that's there for the whole time. We have some long living ones. I'm not sure what these threads are, but it's worth looking into what the threads are that, that persisted for so long. Um, and then what are these loops really mean? Here's some uh, pictorial examples of a hypergraph and its social complex um, uh, picked out just from one of these times. Um, and, and then we can compare that to this edit cost of the different kinds of edit costs, individual, collective, immutable. These are normalized by the number of vertices and edges. Um, I'm not really seeing much of a pattern or much of a correlation here. And that's kind of where we are. We, I'm going to leave you with this kind of open question of how do we <clears throat> tie some of our topological measurements to our discrete measurements, if, if at all, are we, or are we getting something completely different? And I think mostly we're getting something completely different, um, but, but there are some ties that we see. So just to put it all in one slide, uh, take home message that discrete relational structures are really prevalent when modeling data. Hopefully, if I've convinced you of anything, it's that. It's graphs and hypergraphs are really prevalent when modeling real data, either static or dynamic. And the discrete network science can provide insight into these, but there are interesting topological properties, or at least there are topological properties, and we think that they're interesting. They're available and starting to really be explored, um, but there's a lot of open questions still. Um, how do we interpret the topology that we're discovering in these discrete structures? How do we tie it back to the, the real data? And this is where we really need partnerships between mathematicians and subject matter experts, those people to tell us, uh, well, you found this loop and I can tell you what that means in the case of a biological system or a cyber system or a subreddit. Um, and and that's, that's where I'm gonna leave it. I'm gonna leave it on this slide and I'm not gonna stop my screen share because I'm afraid that will crash soon. So I'll take any questions that there might be. I suggest we unmute ourselves to uh, thank Emily for the wonderful talk. I can see there were two comments or questions uh, on the chat window. And um, feel free to unmute yourself and, uh, you know, um, make these uh, comments uh, aloud. But yeah, so people have been quite active on the chat. Um, I'll wait for a couple of seconds. If not, I'll start uh, reading this. I'll, I'll ask one. Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> Hi, Emily. It's Steve Huntsman. Hi, um, Steve. Um, thanks for the talk. Um, you guys, uh, about four weeks ago, put out a paper on topological analysis of temporal yeah. stuff. Yeah. And you were working with uh, the OPTC data at DARPA. Yes. Um, and I have some experience working on, on TC. And I was curious if, if you guys thought about doing sort of Dowker style things for 
hosts versus processes or hosts versus users i say i'm like like the sort of data that los alamos put out yeah right um the short answer i think is yes we've built a lot of different hypergraphs um and topological structures from that optc data that paper really just scratched the surface um and and we're diving into it a lot more in a different project so um i think stay tuned we we're really turning over and over and over that that data from a hypergraph and a uh, hypergraph topology perspective. Um, so, yeah, yes, <laughs> I think. Yeah, I, I think the Docker stuff is likely to to bear fruit for stuff like uh, for bona fide like uh, malice or you know true anomalies. Right, because yeah. like, say, if you have like one, one, you know, APT sort of person, they're going to try to establish multiple footholds to get to a certain place, right. and all of a sudden, you you've got like one homology, right? Right, right, yeah, um, and and yes, I think we we can see some of that stuff. Um, the another yet another project we are looking at some Docker stuff as well. So um, I, I think. It's it's coming together, and and maybe we should chat uh, over an email thread to to brainstorm a bit. But I think um, we're definitely thinking along the same lines. Cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I see, there's a bunch of stuff in chat. I'm not sure what I should. see are there any more questions or comments i think people should should feel free to unmute themselves and let's see ask questions now i have two two little things sure. um <clears throat> so i guess one is um i'm reminded of a talk that i heard by michael erdman a while back looking at the topology of privacy which i oh. think which which was very similar i mean it was dealing with the same basic problem or not the same basic problem, the same basic structure of you have, you know, say test subjects and conditions uh -huh. and and you want to minimize the chances that someone looking at the table of anonymized test subjects and conditions can infer who the person is. OK, um, so yeah. you've got a so you've got a, a hypergraph or a post that, you know, however you want to think about it. Yeah. Um, so that's that's just something I thought of. But. I've been doing a lot of work on essentially hypergraphs, um, but looking at the uh, the essentially the equivalent of a Stanley Reasoner ideal for a hypergraph, um, where you take you you treat it as a you treat your hypergraph as a a variety in F two, and then the appropriate ideal is generated by pseudo monomials. So it looks like a monomial ideal, except that sometimes instead of xj, you have one minus xj. Hmm. Um, and this turns, and there's been a lot of work to try and take that and like find, say, a free resolution, which would give you the Betty numbers. Um, hmm. And I, I'm now wondering if, I'm wondering which of the complexes that you have talked about today that you built out of your hypergraph might be encoded in this way. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Um, those are not interpretations that I'm familiar with. I mean, I know polynomial, polynomial ideals and rings, um, but I'd have to think more about the specific construction that you're talking about to see if there is a connection. One thing that that is worth pointing out is that there's a slew of these uh, interpretations of hypergraphs as topological structures, right? Yeah. You once you think you've come up with all of them, you can come up with another defensible one, um, and it's going to capture something else about your hypergraph. Um, and and so it could be something that we've already looked at, or it could be something totally different um, and capturing yet a different lens or yet a different property of the underlying system yeah so yeah i i don't know but um i'd be interested to explore it yeah i'll, I'll maybe send you an email because this 
yeah. this is stuff that I'm actively thinking about. Also, I, I've got some hypergraph problems that I need to look at. So Sure. Yeah, would love to connect. Thanks. Emily, uh, on your like first or second slide, there were these two versions of um, what looked like making um, these relationship matrices that describe these um, into uh, square matrices. Um, I saw one that um, took away the um, the identity in the middle. Yeah. Uh, and, um, me... and I'm wondering, uh, what, what did, did those get used for some sort of like a spectral decomposition or something? I, I'm assuming you're talking about these. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, yes, they, well, they're, they're the adjacency matrices, the weighted adjacency matrices of mm -hmm. the underlying clique expansion and line graph. Oh, right. Okay. So, so yeah, that's exactly what, what these are. You can think of them in your favorite way, either pictorially, set-wise, or um, in, in this linear algebra sense. So, um, and I don't want to say anything false, but I believe these would be the two to one dimension, one dimensional boundary matrices. If you were to, um, well, that might not be true. No, that's that's not true. Um, but yeah, you, these are adjacency matrices, so you can start doing spectral analysis, yeah. um, all that. Okay. Stuff. But they're and they're weighted. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was wondering. Cause you know, I, I'm not normally used to seeing those as just ones, of course, because they're, right. I see graphs, right. but, um, yeah. d does that, I mean, is, is that something that people commonly do and get use out of in the case of hypergraphs? The waiting here or the, uh, or the, the, like, uh, doing spectral decomposition on this kind of stuff. Oh, um, there, there are works out there on, well, like, Hodge decompositions of um, related to hypergraphs and simplicial complexes. Uh, and I know those are, people get use out of those. Um, and I believe the answer would be yes <clears throat> uh, for spectral. Uh, for that, you probably want to ask more um, my colleagues, Sanan Axoy and Stephen Young. They are um, graph theory uh, folks, and they work heavily with spectral analysis. And I believe they are looking at some spectral decompositions of um, of these kinds of interpretations, cool. but also looking at what you can't see. Because, as I mentioned, you know, the yeah. even if you have this matrix and this matrix, even if you uh, have the weights in the two matrices not just the underlying graphs, but the weights as well, you still can't recover the full uh, hypergraph. Right. So um, you can get information for sure, but you're not uh, you're not narrowing it down to a single hypergraph. You might have multiple hypergraphs that are consistent. Yeah, that, that's interesting. I wonder what the extensions are there. Hey, thank you. Yeah. Right, so I'm going to um, I'm stop recording, but uh, let's um, thank you very much for the, for the talk. And but if people want to stay, stick around for a few more minutes, and if they have additional comments or questions, please, by all means.